hope uh, uh, I'm very glad we have the chance uh, to have here that uh, this is a, a group of people um, to which I uh, I should not introduce him in a very lengthy manner because all of you know him, know, know his works. So I will just leave it at that. Tell you again, I'm very glad we have the chance to have him here. And I will just uh, give him the, the floor. The pretext of today's talk is the book uh, on a theory of uh, socialism and capitalism. Uh, so, Professor, mm -hmm. please. Thank you, uh, Christian, and thank you, Tudor, and thank you, Vlad, for having me. It's a pleasure. It's my second, second trip to Romania. I think the first one was about 15 years ago. Something like this. Um, little insights, in a way, are simple insights. Um, just think of the famous argument that Mises developed uh, about the impossibility of calculation under socialism. Once you have heard this argument that um, if you don't have prices for factors of production, uh, then you cannot compare input and output prices and you cannot determine whether you produce efficiently or inefficiently. Um, and without private property and factors of production, you have permanent misallocations. Now, once you have heard it, it seems to be almost trivial. Um, on the other hand, as you all know, um, the majority of the economics profession did not, was not convinced of this, of this statement until uh, 1989. And even nowadays, I have my doubts that many of them have grasped these simple insights. And I think that uh, in my book, Socialism and Capitalism, um, there are also two important but also very elementary insights contained that are then was then elaborated by me in other works. I should mention that Theory of Socialism and Capitalism was my first English book and um, being a speaker of German, <coughs> um, you always had the habit of constructing huge lengthy sentences, uh, sometimes half a page long. I did some translating myself um, from German to long English. Um, uh, Richard von Striegel, a book on capital and production. And uh, literally every sentence was half a page long. And in English, you simply cannot write in this way. So you had to break these sentences down into a large number of sentences. So this is definitely one of the weaknesses that I still have in this book, that my sentences are exorbitantly long. Um, that has been gradually improved uh, in, in, my, in my later works. But I should, should warn you, this is, uh, this is something that Germans suffer from. This part. Um, in any case, the two main points that I developed in there and then later on in other works. Um, one, one is an economic point and the other one is um, uh, an ethical argument. Let me start with, with the economic point and as I emphasized, um, a very simple one. The question is simply, um, how can you acquire wealth and how can you become richer? And there are two ways of acquiring wealth and getting richer. The first way is what I call the productive way. And there are three simple principles involved. Um, the first way of acquiring additional wealth, becoming richer is you engage in what is called 
original appropriation of goods that were previously unowned. So we begin, so to speak, with the beginning of mankind. There's just one guy out there. And how can he get richer? Um, so the first thing is he recognizes there are outside some things that he regards as good for something. Uh, and he brings them under his control. Um, and obviously he does this only because he thinks bringing them under control will make me better off than I would be if I would not bring them under my control. That's the first way of getting rich. Um, I should also mention that the first person who appropriates something that was previously unowned by anyone does not in any meaningful sense take anything away from somebody else. Everybody else had the chance to appropriate that too. But they didn't recognize it or they were at some other place. So they, nobody can claim in a way, this guy stole it from me. Uh, that would only make sense if somebody else had already control over it. But if it is a resource that was unowned before, this guy is wealthier than he was before and nobody else is made worse off. You're all familiar with this so-called Pareto criterion that says how can we improve social welfare given the fact that we cannot do interpersonal comparisons of utility. And the criterion then says uh, one person must at least be better off and nobody else must be made worse off. So this original appropriation fulfills, the way I interpret it, fulfills this criterion. What is the second way to uh, become wealthier is to then engage in productive activities. That is, use your own physical body, use those things that you originally appropriated, and then transform these materials into something that you consider to be a more valuable configuration of material than the point from which you started. Again, you would not produce in this way unless you thought the transformation of material was beneficial to you. It might, of course, be, be the case that looking backward, you come to the conclusion Oh, I tried to build this and then it collapsed on top of me and I was not better off, but I had hoped that I would be better off. So looking forward, any act of production is of course also enhancing the welfare of somebody, uh, of, the, of the producer himself. And again, if we now look at what effect does this have on other people, we can say if the producer did not, in the course of producing, physically damage what other people had <coughs> appropriated. Leaves the physical integrity in place. Then we can say again, one person is made better off by this act of production. There is now a more valuable good in existence that previously did not exist. He is better off all the rest of the people have just as much as before, provided that no physical damage has occurred to whatever they claimed as their own resources which they had produced or they had originally appropriated. So that's the second way of becoming richer. And then the third productive way is to engage in a voluntary exchange. So what I have produced, I exchange against what somebody else has produced. And every voluntary exchange benefits actually two individuals, both exchange partners, otherwise the exchange would simply not take place. Again, of course, only ex ante, that means looking forward. Again, I can be disappointed about what I acquired. Um, but looking forward, uh, I expect to be better off giving up whatever I give up and acquiring what I acquire. And the other person must have opposite preference orders, uh, but he must think of this exchange in exactly the same way. 
So again, we can say in this situation, two people are better off than they otherwise would have been, and the rest of the world has just all the goods that they previously had, so nobody is made worse in any meaningful sense. So these are the productive ways. And then there are, of course, unproductive ways of acquiring wealth. Um, a person comes and takes away either in full or partially what another person has originally appropriated. In that case, we have a winner and a loser. Um, and the Pareto criterion would not be fulfilled because we cannot make interpersonal comparisons of utility. If we could do this, of course, then the situation would be, would be different than uh, 20 utils accrue to me and, uh, and 50 utils are lost at somebody else and we say, oh, okay, net gain of 30 utils or something like this. Since we can't do that, so we can, all we can say is one person gains, the other person loses. This is not uh, a change that fulfills the Pareto criterion. Um, the same is true if somebody takes away what I have produced, uh, or either again the whole amount or part, part of it. Again, we have a loser and we have a winner. Pareto criterion is not fulfilled. Um, and finally, if, uh, if somebody does not rely exclusively on voluntary exchanges but uh, forces somebody to engage in the exchange, then again we have a winner and a loser and we cannot say this uh, change is, so to speak, a change that fulfills the Pareto criterion. Um, and by and large, all societies can then be, uh, and the, if you look at the, the classes of actors that engage in, uh, in non-productive exchanges, uh, we find by and large that there are two types. The first are the plain criminals. Everybody agrees that the plain criminals are plain criminals, uh, uh, that they obviously do not contribute anything to wealth, but redistribute it in their own, uh, in their own favor. And then we have the second class of individuals uh, that compose that a composed state, which is an institutionalized form of, uh, of taking away what productive people have done and, uh, and, and, and using it for, uh, for, their, own, uh, for their own purposes. Um, if we compare societies, then if we ignore for, for a moment just the uh, the plain criminals that, that exist in any type of society. And because the main difference between different societies is made up by, this, by the institutional aggressor, uh, aggressors and by the f extent to which they interfere with the productive work of people who uh, enhance, uh, enhance welfare. And there we have um, yeah, uh, degrees. Uh, some societies, some states do more of that and some societies um, do less of that. Um, my students always complained, or sometimes they complained, that I, uh, when I compared uh, the United States government also with a gang, the gang of gangsters, I said, yeah, but that is, um, you can't say that, compare that with the Soviet Union or so, and I said, of course, uh, they are also good gangsters or relatively good gangsters and not so good gangsters. The example I always gave was a friend who went to a, um, um, one of these uh, ATM, ATM machines and a mugger was standing behind him um, and um, asked him to hand over his uh, 300 euros that he had gotten out of the ATM machine and, uh, and then my friend negotiated with him. Um, and said, you know, it's late at night, I still want to have a few beers. Um, I'm now completely out of money, wouldn't you be willing to just give me a little bit back? And, uh, and he encountered the person who gave him 50 euros back of, of the 300 that he stole before. Uh, and he was, of course, elated. 
despises uh, <laughs> because it might well happen that uh, on top of it they kick your teeth out or break your kneecap and uh, as comp and then I said this is the difference between the United States government and uh, the government that you had in Romania and uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, in one case they give you a little bit back and uh, and you are happy that they do that and that they don't break your kneecap as they do in other places. Um, so this is the first, the, this is so to speak the economic message uh, of the whole thing. Now I come to the, um, to the ethical uh, message that is contained in there. Um, so let me first make make the point that if there were no scarcity in the world, so we would live in the Garden of Eden. In that case, it is impossible to have conflicts over resources. Everything that exists in superabundance, we don't need to fight over. Um, we would not need a moral system, so to speak, if all around abundance exists. We can do whatever we want. It doesn't affect anybody else. Everybody else can just satisfy all of his desires uh, regardless of what I would do, so to speak. Um, but even in the Garden of Eden, uh, there's one thing that is still scarce, uh, of which we do not have a superabundance, and that is our own physical body. Um, so even in the Garden of Eden, is it possible that somebody wants to do something to my body or I want to do something to his, uh, to his body and then we have a conflict and the conflict is a conflict over something that is scarce. There exists less of it than people might desire. I have not an infinite number of, uh, of bodies. Um, and in the real world, of course, there exists scarcity not just of bodies but of all sorts of all sorts of things. So we can say first a few words about what is the purpose of having rules of social uh, norms and rules of social life in general. Okay. Is it because of scarcity we need rules that allow us to avoid otherwise unavoidable conflict. Uh, Again, we can imagine, of course, that as if by magic God had arranged the world in such a world, in such a way that whatever I do is exactly what you want me to do. And whatever you do is exactly what I want you to do. In such a perfect world, of course, we also wouldn't need any rules. This is the perfect, perfect harmony has been instilled, so to speak, in our heads from the beginning on. Uh, but we, as we all know, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not the case. Um, uh, conflicts do exist. And the purpose of rules is to make it possible that conflicts that otherwise would be unavoidable, that those conflicts can be, can be avoided. So now let me just introduce quickly the rules and then I'll defend them um, that would make it possible that conflict from the beginning of mankind can conceivably uh, be avoided. And these, conf and these rules are uh, similar to the ones that I already touched upon when I talked about uh, how do we create wealth. So the first one is every person owns his own physical body, has an exclusive right over his own physical body, uh, can do with his physical body whatever he wants. Anybody else would have to ask permission to do something to it. The second one is everyone who is the first one to appropriate a good that was previously unowned becomes the exclusive owner of this good. Next one is 
everyone who produces something with appropriated means and the help of his own physical body becomes the exclusive owner of what he has produced. And finally, you can also acquire the right to exclusive control of scarce resources by transferring something from a previous owner to a later owner in the form of um, a voluntary, uh, voluntary exchange. Now, how can we justify uh, these rules? If we take the first, the first principle, everyone um, uh, is the exclusive owner of his physical body. That is, so to speak, the decisive, the decisive point. Um, now, whenever people have some sort of conflict, remember, we only need rules because we have conflicts with each other, uh, then, of course, what we can do is we can just talk about having a conflict. We engage in, uh, in an argument. Um, we can also imagine that people could not engage in any type of argument. But, but then we would only have fights in this situation. Uh, that either I kill you or you kill me or I do something to you or you do some, something to me. But there is no talk about any, any of this. What we, however, can do uh, is we can ask for a justification. Well, why did you do this? Did you, are you entitled to do this? We can say yes, yes and no, and so forth. If we couldn't do this, again, we wouldn't have any ethical problems. We only have ethical problems because we can just talk about ethical problems. So we have a conflict, and now we discuss uh, who is right and who is wrong. The discussion can also be, is there anything like right and wrong in questions like the of this kind? But it should be clear that the starting point always has to be arguing. There's no other way that we can begin to build up an ethical system or to make a decision there is no such thing as ethics. Even if he would come to the conclusion there is no such thing as ethics, as right rules and wrong rules, even that point would have to be made in the form of an argument. So that's why some philosophers have called this, this is the a priori of argumentation. You must start with this point. Nobody can just say, no, I, I, I choose a different point. Because if he says this, I choose a different starting point, he already admits that, no, this is, of course, the point from which we have to begin. And then we see that if we argue with each other, I say something, then you say something in response, I say something back and so forth, and then we come to the conclusion either we agree or we don't, it, we don't agree, whatever it is, um, that underlying argumentation are certain things that are presupposed by argumentation. Arguing is not just free-floating sounds uh, that go back and forth in, uh, in mid-air. Arguing is some form of activity. It is an activity that is either interested in establishing, so to speak, a truth claim, somebody says this is right and somebody else says this is wrong, or it is a claim of uh, just or unjust, there is such thing as justice, there is no such thing as justice and so forth. So we are making truth claims. And what we notice, of course, is that arguing as a specific form of acting uh, involves that I have exclusive control over my body, my brain, my vocal cord, and I allow my opponent to also make exclusive control over his body, his vocal cords, his, uh, uh, his brain, and so forth. Uh, uh, and he then again in turn by talking to me and uh, listening to my uh, my point of view, again, takes for granted that uh, I have exclusive control 
uh, over my body and I only with my own means, with the means of my body, come to the right inside and that my opponent only by using his own physical body comes to the right conclusion or we both come to the conclusion that we simply cannot agree on this thing but we do not fight uh, we do not use sticks or stones in order to make our argument all we make is uh, saying something and hoping that on his own he will come up with the right insight. So in this way we can say anyone who engages in any type of argumentation implicitly admits that all participants in an argumentation are the exclusive owner of their own physical, physical body. And what comes to, when we come to the other rules and recall the purpose of rules is to avoid conflict so if every person is exclusive owner of his own physical body then all conflicts can indeed be ruled out uh, everybody recognizes this is his this is mine uh, only by invitation can I do something to him and so forth all f conflicts interpersonal conflicts involving bodies could be avoided if people adhere to this to this rule. Um, all conflicts can be avoided uh, if we adopt the rule that the first appropriator of something that was previously unowned becomes the owner because by appropriating something for the first time no conflict arises. Um, if we would have a rule for instance saying the second one becomes the owner not the first one then of course we would have a conflict. Uh, there's the first one is there and the first one of course would protest the fact that the second one is made uh, the owner. They physically clash with each, uh, with each other. Um, and, um, uh, and of course the same then applies for voluntary exchanges and so forth. So again not to just draw that out for too long. Um, again, I think the argument here, the moral argument that I do, is also a very simple and elementary one. Who, whoever and whenever we engage in an argument, then we implicitly recognize the right of each individual to be the exclusive owner uh, of, of his physical body and any other type of ruling could not be argumentatively uh, defended without running into some sort of uh, contradiction. Maybe one additional word. Now, people might oppose this argument by saying yeah but, uh, but people don't have to be rational and interested in argumentation. Now that is of course certainly uh, certainly true um, but people who simply refuse to do this sort of stuff we don't owe them an answer. Um, only people who engage in this type of activity deserve an answer uh, and if they engage in this activity then we can give them an answer. Uh, that is each one must be recognized as the exclusive owner of his uh, own body otherwise we simply could not do what we do. And it is also impossible to just argue that we don't have to be rational. As soon as you say we don't have to be rational this guy is already committed to rationality. So the opponents of this argument would have to be just shutting up forever. So they would never have to open their mouths, never claim anything to be true and right and something that somebody else did as wrong. But if they would never ever open their mouths, never ever engage in any type of argumentation, then they are for us nothing else but uh, stones and animals and whatever that is to say, we don't owe them any justification. 
But if they do engage in these sorts of things, then we do have a justification for our fundamental norms. All right, that should be uh, sufficient for, for introduction. Now, as I said, um, or as I didn't say, <coughs> you can um, either take up some of these things that I said here, or you can um, um, extend the discussion to any type of <coughs> other subjects as well. I'm um, always interested in, um, in a wide range of, of subjects, by no means exclusively to these abstract philosophical things. But um, whatever you want to talk about, please feel free to do so, and I'll do my best to satisfy your curiosity. Thank you, Professor Monte. Uh, I guess, uh, for starters, uh, I will just give the floor to the other announced speakers of today. And uh, I should start with uh, Denis Okachu, uh, which, again, all of you probably know. Uh, and he's the translator of, uh, of the theory of socialism and capitalism in, uh, in May. And he testified here about the length of, uh, of the sentences. Of the, of the sentences. <laughs> he, already <laughs> made, he already mentioned it. Lo longer me. than half a page. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I, I just want to, uh, first of all, to thank uh, Christian Komonescu for the opportunity to translate this book, because he was the one commission, commissioning the, the job to me. And uh, I, I will just touch upon a few points, uh, focusing mostly on what I see as the uh, philosophical contributions of Professor Hoppe in this book. And uh, maybe focusing on, on an evocation of what the experience of translating and discussing this book was uh, back in the 90s. When, when we did it. It's, um, uh, well, I, I'm disappointed to hear that you consider the, uh, the style a weakness because we made so much effort to uh, translate uh, respecting the style. <laughs> you should have told us back then. But uh, I, I just want to say I, I'm not sure, and I, I do hope that the translation uh, does justice to the book. Uh, because it is an experience, and I, I, recommend, uh, I recommend you all to, to read also the book in English. Because it is an, an experience uh, in uh, not only the clarity of, of the argument uh, and the, uh, the soundness of, of the construction, but also in, uh, in style. Because uh, this long phrase and uh, the way in which it is constructed uh, has a sort of philosophical perfume, I would say, that uh, many uh, contemporary works do not have. So it might be a weakness, theoretical weakness, but for the reader it might also be an advantage. Make, if, if I'm permitted to make one, one remark on this, yes, some of, some of my German philosophy teachers told me a real philosophy you can only do in German. Uh, so in, in English you can only do shallow philosophy. Um, so it, it, to a certain extent I agree with well, what well, you, you said. You do, you, you do it in German, it's just with English words. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's a translation uh, I, I did under Christian's supervision uh, back in the 90s. And uh, young, when you're young, you always commit sins. And uh, after a while, looking back, you are proud of some of the sins, and you are ashamed of other sins. So it's, it's one of the sins of the youth of which I'm proud to, to translate this book. 
And uh, now uh, I, I, I just want to, to highlight uh, two or three uh, very important philosophical points that I that I that I saw in the in the book. Uh, first is the argument, the theory of property rights, which Professor Hoppe highlighted here. I won't uh, go again to the details, but uh, I think the the way in which is constructed uh, is not only highly original in the context, but highly productive for further uh, developments. Because one of the things that is uh, very challenging is the using of uh, thought experiment uh, to uh, justify uh, to, and to substantiate at the same time the theory of property rights. And one important thing about the mental experiments is that usually uh, people think, well, in mental experiments you can do anything. You can imagine all sorts of uh, universes, words, with no limit whatsoever, because no, sky is the limit for a mental experiment. What's very uh, interesting and important in uh, Professor Hoppe's experiment on the Garden of Eden is that you can't, you cannot do anything in a mental experiment. Even a mental experiment has some limits. And uh, when you try to imagine a world without scarcity, uh, what Professor Shof Hoppe shows is that you simply cannot do that because there are logical limits to what you can imagine uh, even as a theoretical tool because uh, in the world purported to be without scarcity there are still some scarce things physical body and, and so on and so forth and uh, this is a nice a very nice counterexample and a very deep counterexample to uh, the usual usage of mental experiments in moral philosophy when different guys just think roles here, imagine all kinds of things, no limit whatsoever, they don't care about the logical limits to uh, the interaction problems that the agents face in, in those mental experiments. Uh, also, I, uh, I, I think the the idea of justifying the uh, libertarian theory of property rights by showing that it is assumed by anybody who wants to uh, argue against such theory uh, is also a very powerful tool that we can all use when discussing with, uh, let's say, not so libertarian minded people. Uh, and, uh, but I guess the development of this argument is, here it's only a, a sketch and I would like to, uh, to point to uh, later work, I guess it was in Ethics and Economics of Private Property, where you, uh, develop the full-fledged uh, performative contradiction argument. Here it's only a sketch, it's later developed on a, on a full scale. And uh, for those of you who uh, would want to go deeper into this argument, I, I recommend also reading, and I'm sure most of you all have already did that, the, uh, the Ethics and Economics of Private Property. Also, uh, I I would like I, I say something that maybe uh, maybe uh, Professor Hoppe wouldn't necessarily maybe enjoy this very much, but I uh, one of the merits that I see is that uh, this theory of property rights is one of the uh, most powerful is illustrations in the 20th century for uh, a human account on the. Uh, and I, I want to uh, put it very carefully, a human account on the function of norms, of rules. Not, mm -hmm. not on the content of rules, yeah. but on the function of rules. So in, in this respect, uh, 
I guess this argument recovers a very powerful intellectual tradition of Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, and it's again very important because the mainstream is to see uh, norms, to see rules as either uh, the kind of uh, production of hopeful monsters, as uh, someone put it, like moral intuition, or uh, you have to posit all kinds of uh, weird entities or uh, faculties in order to show what rules are for. And for Hume and also for, for Professor Hoppe, the rules are there to solve problems of interaction. It's nothing mysterious, nothing metaphysical about them. It's just to uh, solve the problems that uh, people face when uh, bumping into each other in one way or another. And this, uh, this I guess, offers uh, this tradition, this view of the, on the function of rules. Uh, offers offers moral philosophers, moral theorists, uh, the sort of instrument and understanding of what morality is about that uh, totally lacks, or almost totally lacks, in the moral philosophy of the 20th century. I mean, uh, Hume was uh, uh, forgotten, and uh, uh, Mill, or sometimes Kant, what uh, in, in 20th, 20th century with regard to the, uh, to the function, to the understanding of the function, function of rules. And uh, this recovery seems very important for me. Also, I, I would like to, uh, to point out very briefly on uh, the powerful critique of uh, positivism in the book, which again, uh, I think it's very important because <coughs> Uh, the scientific academic world uh, surely in economics you'd be surprised to hear that also in philosophy uh, is dominated by some sort of allegiance to positivism if not fully to a full-fledged version of positivism, at least to some mild or uh, hidden versions of positivism. And uh, the pointing out, uh, pointing out the, uh, uh, the risks and weaknesses of uh, a positivist outline or underlying assumption for uh, ethical and economic theorizing uh, is, a, uh, is a reminder that I, I guess we should uh, bear in mind. And I, I would just like to, to finish. Again, uh, we are in, a, in an economics uh, institution, but I, I felt the need to uh, to address the, the topic of the philosophical contributions in the book because uh, I think they are very important and uh, sometimes uh, unfortunately overlooked by uh, persons discussing the book or criticizing the book. And I just like to, uh, uh, on a more personal note, to, uh, to say that uh, it was I mean, imagine the 90s in Romania. Uh, we all lived a bit then. Uh, some, some were more mature, some of us very young probably, but uh, I think I would say I'm the second generation of Romanian libertarians after 89, with Christian being first generation. Mm -hmm and some other guys, they teaching us and then uh, propagating the, the ideas, but uh, this, uh, it was a, an experience. I mean, for, uh, for the mental framework, which was usual in the, in the period, uh, I, uh, I remember when first uh, going to Christian's private seminar on 
uh, human action. I was there in the corner and to listen to the guys and reading the text and I say, wow, wow. And then after a while, I, uh, uh, it was the, uh, a private seminar uh, with the students in the philosophy department on the theory of uh, socialism and capitalism. Uh, I guess uh, you were there and Ionella was there. <coughs> it was 95, 96 or later, a bit later. Later. A bit later. But, uh, yeah, later, 98, 99. But again, it was, uh, it was an incredible experience reading and discussing and uh, having the feeling that, okay, we finally have the tool to uh, answer the questions of uh, our opponents in the classroom, in the beer house, because People talk philosophy in the beer houses by then. And that, uh, it was a, a very important experience, intellectually and uh, personally, to, uh, uh, to read these books and get acquainted with, uh, with these ideas. So uh, that, that I would. Before you say something, two, two, two remarks. The first, um, it's a biographical remark. My my uh, PhD dissertation was on on you. Uh, so uh, even though on his epistemology, I had mostly disagreements with him on when it comes to his moral philosophy and his insight into scarcity, scarcity and scarcity. Uh, leading to conflicts requiring rules and so forth. In, in that regard, I did learn from you, and I have also quoted him in, uh, uh -huh. in that book. Um, the second, about your point, which I think was very interesting, um, that, uh, that you don't have com complete freedom, so to speak, in your thought experiments. Um, Think of, for instance, about the thought experiments that John Rawls does, um, where people sit behind a veil of ignorance um, and then are su supposed to reflect about what, what rules would be appropriate or not. Now, the people sitting behind the veil of ignorance, they are not restricted by any type of scarcity whatsoever. Um, they have no scarcity of of time, uh, no ski. I mean, wh why do I need to contemplate what rules should be adopted? Then my answer would be, well, yeah, then I just keep sitting behind the veil of ignorance and never do anything at all. Um, so only, only yeah, entities that have absolutely no resemblance with us could do what Rawls asks us to do, sort of imagining us behind the veil of ignorance. The word scarcity does not even appear in the index of his book. Um, in a world without scarcity, there's, okay, uh, I don't have to write a book at all. <laughs> uh, one, just one word. It, it is, however, an important distinction in the, in the account of uh, property, rules in Hume and uh, Hoppe. And uh, not, I mean, for Hume, the account is, of, is evolutionary, while for you, it's counterfactual, which, which is a great difference, a, a very important difference. But uh, yes, on the, the basic understanding of the function of uh, property rules, I would. Yeah, uh, I agree. Kirsty, you were supposed to say well, something? Uh, <laughs> First of all, I want to thank uh, especially Professor Pope here uh, for his unflagging support. Uh, not, not only, I remember when I was very young, first I read, uh, well, not, not very young, but in the early 90s, I read the uh, Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty, a uh, few shorter pieces by Mises. Uh, human action was too big a bone for me. But then I discovered Hans Hoppe, and uh, 
I wrote him and he was immediately enthusiastic. He sent me books, papers. And uh, then he came here. Uh, he always promoted the, uh, you know, uh, I would almost say selflessly, the Mises Rothbard uh, paradigm uh, in, uh, in uh, ethics and economics. Uh, and uh, for that, I think uh, we must thank him. Then also about the book. This is a powerful book. Uh, I think it is uh, some of, some of, some, some of uh, like uh, Stefan Kinsella, uh, Hoppe, uh, Professor Hoppe's uh, followers consider it even the strongest book on uh, this kind of a priori uh, uh, foundations of uh, epistemology and uh, ethics. And uh, it is nevertheless very straightforward, uh, very understandable for the young people. It has a great impact. Uh, and so uh, it was one of the first books uh, we wanted here to have translated. And uh, I want to thank Emi Sokacu for his enthusiasm. He did it uh, very quickly, very well. But then we had this, uh, and he was very nice, he never was angry about this. We had this great difficulty to, to, to get it through. So it was much easier, for instance, to have Walter Block, you know, uh, uh, his, his book, uh, or uh, even Mises, the Argentina lectures. But for some reason, even though this was one of the best transla translations we had, it was very difficult. And uh, this is a, a good question. Why is such a clear, straightforward, strong book covering epistemology, ethics, economics, uh, comparative economic systems, uh, has such a difficult time to get through. And I remember I was uh, arguing with one of my history professors and uh, speaking about the theory and the history of pure capitalism versus pure socialism. And he said, Christian, if you, I mean, everything you say sounds correct. But why doesn't it, it have more uh, impact? And uh, at that time I tried the, basically the Mises answer, saying that, well, it it's all boils up to the rationality of you know, people. If people are rational, they will accept it, if not, not. Uh, well, just for, you know, now I have this conservative answer that I know my teacher, who is now uh, gone, uh, would, would like. I will just give you two uh, quotes. One is from General Robert E. Lee, who uh, talked very rarely uh, about why he thought that the, uh, his fight for the Confederacy was uh, the right fight and uh, it was closely linked to the prospect of the American Republic versus Empire. And uh, he, he didn't talk much about this, although he was invited. And uh, at, at one point he said, at present, the public mind is not prepared to receive the truth. And uh, why would that be? A conservative thinker who is also interested in uh, Mises and Woods and uh, libertarian principle, uh, he gave this answer, people must be in a state of grace to listen to the truth more especially when it come, comes as a remonstrance. So I think, uh, yeah, we need to take into account some uh, additional anthropological and perhaps even metaphysical uh, presuppositions to make sense of both such uh, uh, explanations and uh, praxeology and ethics. I, I won't insist on that, but if you wish to come in, if you have other explanations, I, I, I'm interested. Just very briefly, uh, maybe one or two points about the book. Uh, so it, got, it, it goes, in a sense, far beyond than just establishing the first principle, so to speak, of uh, economics and ethics, because it, it provides 
a kind of method for uh, establishing first principles. Uh, and the method is this. The question is, what is presupposed in a certain way of arguing of do or doing things? It also covers, for instance, uh, empirical science. Because you cannot do empirical science without experimentation. But experiment presupposes some trans-empirical, if you want, uh, assumptions including and especially the idea of uh, time invariant causality because uh, if, you, if you have event A following event B in a laboratory it is just a one instance event if it is to have any meaningful uh, 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 significance across time then you have to if you have to interpret it as if you must if you if you can interpret it as, a, as, a, as an experiment, you have to presuppose uh, time invariant causality. So it, it is a, a non-empirical, trans-empirical, if you want, presupposition of the empirical sciences. So uh, then we have, of course, uh, and he has already touched upon this. Uh, an additional, and Professor uh, Hoppe, an additional axiom for the senses of human action. Because, uh, of course, uh, we have to, to add an additional, so to speak, trans-empirical presupposition, the presupposition of human action. And that is because we cannot not act by, as Professor Hoppe would say, even by arguing against human action, we must act. Uh, so, uh, therefore, we would be caught in, uh, in performative contradiction if we would uh, try to uh, argue against human action. So, therefore, it is a necessary presupposition of all your theory of, uh, of, uh, human, of the, the human sciences. And, of course, uh, there is this uh, third element. What is the ethical presupposition of non-conflict? And I will not repeat it. Professor Hoppe has shown us again that is, it, it is basically the norms of libertarian ethics, self-ownership, and homestanding. It would be interesting here again as a challenge uh, to point out that perhaps the most that there are very few people who have seriously challenged this argument, but where they have challenged it, and I think Stefan Kinsella has entered into the dis discussions with the challengers, they have usually challenged whether it is or not possible to make arguments without getting into self-contradiction uh, by uh, getting rid of the universalizability principle. And I would ask this question to, to, to Professor Hoffer now. For instance, if, if you have Rousseau on his island alone, alone is, is it possible for him to have, so to speak, autistic argumentation? So he argues, but only with himself. So his universe of argumentation is a one-man universe, autistic argumentation. Now, Friday comes along, but he is more interested in doing some experiments uh, treating him like, like another computer. He already has a computer, but he will need a better computer. He will never presuppose that he is an independent, argumentative agent. He will just maybe talk to him like he talks to his uh, artificial intelligence computer. But he will always, always evaluate what he hears himself. So he, he is still a, 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 an autistic. Uh, argument data. And I don't know if, if this would work, uh, then of course the next step would be to restrict, for instance, to my tribe. I, I, I restrict the, the, the set of argument data to my tribe. Uh, can I do this without getting into, into, into self-contradiction? Now, I, I looked up what, what Stefan King said, and some of the remarks he makes and on this I will close this. Uh, this question is, if you propose any non-libertarian norm 
that norm must be not universalizable and or fail to set forth a property allocation system that makes conflict avoidance possible. And this is true so. If you want to propose a non-libertarian norm, you must even either make it non-universalizable, but again the question is can I argue consistently without universalizing across all the human rational beings? For instance, just argumentation. For instance, I believe I'm the Führer of the universe. In a sense, yes, the answer can be then you pose only a technical problem. And this is true. But am I engaged in self-contradiction? This is the question. And uh, of course, uh, or by uh, not making uh, conflict avoidance possible. And his other interesting observation is rejecting universalizability means that any norm whatsoever can be proposed by simply making up a particularistic reason for it. So this is true. This is true. I can basically exclude whomever I want. At the, at the extreme, I can include only myself if I want to conceive of myself as the future of the universe. You know? But uh, this is, and I ask this because it is very uh, pressing question. We have these neoconservatives now who basically say you can torture, or the fear of the universe can torture. He can kill. Uh, he can. Uh, get rid of uh, universal, universal and other uh, uh, area. I, 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 I get over economics because Professor Hopkins already uh, touched upon the end. I'm sure you all want to ask questions. But very, very often the question is asked uh, if you have a libertarian principle, uh, what, for instance, if uh, someone comes swimming to an island that is privately owned? I mean, this question uh, is someone over and over again, this kind of question appears. And uh, uh, the owner will not let him on the island. Now, the assumption is that the only thing that matters is to enforce the two principles, the two libertarian principles. Now, this is and I want to emphasize it not what Professor Hoppe and uh, Rothbard, his mentor, says. And just to give one quote, I have also from Mises, but I will just give one from, from uh, Rothbard. In strict logic, libertarian political doctrine can be severed from all other considerations. Logically, one can be, and indeed most libertarians, in fact, are hedonists, libertines, immoralists, militant enemies of religion in general and Christianity in particular and still be consistent adherence of libertarian politics. In fact, in strict logic, one can be a consistent libertarian property right politically and be a moocher, a sinister, and a petty crook and racketeer in practice, as all too many libertarians turn out to be. Strictly logically, one can do all these things, but psychologically, sociologically, and in practice, it simply doesn't work that way. So we have this uh, classical, basically, Aristotelian insight in, in, the, in the indivisibility of, of the virtues, of you know, traditional virtues, uh, which I think is, is underlying this insight. And the solution, of course, is exclusion. But the very same people who you know, ask this question, they don't want exclusion. And of course, exclusion would precisely work and does work under a private property regime, because uh, we, we would, of course, be able easily to, 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 to discriminate and exclude against antisocial behavior in a private property regime, as, for instance, the Amish do, as many, you know. Uh, but this is exactly what these people don't seem to want, on the other hand, because when Professor Hoppe uh, proposes to, by and large, as much as possible, approximate this kind of exclusion in the case of immigration laws, for instance, these are the same people who protest and who, they would really uh, perhaps hate Professor Hoppe, and this would be the second answer to my first question, most just for this. 
so I think uh, I will close on this and just uh, think that again you don't you cannot have it both ways. So uh, if you really want exclusion of uh, anti-social uh, behavior uh, of uh, yeah of, of declarations of uh, of war like this against the citizenry, like I mentioned at the beginning, whether or not they are self-contradictory. Uh, well, you have to accept the principles of private property and whatever approximation of them is visible under the political conditions in it. Yeah. Again, uh, two brief remarks, uh, uh, starting with the uh, uh, last point. Um, in my later works, um, I point out the importance of exclusion. I point out the importance of upholding bourgeois v values. And I have made myself many enemies among the so-called left libertarians who came to libertarianism only because they think the libertarians allow them to do anything they just want um, and are not aware of the fact that, of course, private property rights also include the right to exclude for whatever reason I have to exclude uh, people in, the, in, the, in my personal life. And I think if we ever want to amount to a uh, respectable, intellectually respectable movement, uh, we have to be far more rigorous uh, when it comes to treating, uh, treating left, li left libertarians with the threat of exclusion. They exclude me from their circles and I don't regret that at all. Um, but I also want to exclude them um, from, from my uh, from my, my circles. Um, uh, groups that say like the Cato Institute, for instance, are very much in favor of these anti-discrimination laws that you have in the United States in, in most countries. Women need special support. Blacks need special support and so forth. And w once you give in to this type of nonsense, there is no stopping, there's no stopping point anymore. So all of these anti-discrimination laws, uh, I think a good libertarian has to reject outright. Uh, discrimination has costs. Uh, yes, uh, that's why most businessmen do not engage in the discrimination that is not based on estimations of the productivity of a person. But it might well be, if I have an Italian restaurant, that I want all the waiters to be Italian waiters because my customers expect to uh, hear Italian chit-chat uh, around and do not want to have a Russian waiter waiting in an Italian restaurant. It, again, every businessman has to make this assessment on his own, but whatever assessment he comes up with, with the risks attached to it, he must be free to do. Um, the, other, uh, the other point uh, about the universalizability. Um, now, first point I would make is this idea of speaking a private language uh, cannot be maintained, I believe, that if you look at the philosophical investigations of Wittgenstein, who shows, I think, quite conclusively that every language is, so to speak, a public, a public language. We cannot even conceive of using a language that only we ourselves understand and no one else could possibly understand, because this person could not even know if he uses his own terms in the same way, in the second instance, and so forth. We need, so to speak, control of the use of our language by physical interaction. So Wittgenstein has this uh, picture of, uh, what's, what does he call it? Sprachspiele or lang language, language games. So you learn, you learn a language by engaging in activities and 
the activities and the language correct each other, so to speak, then we finally know our kid now, a kid understands what the term for means or what the term uh, knife means. Uh, so without tying our words back to some physical, visible things, there's no way that we could actually just communicate with each other. So anybody who does argue does address, so to speak, the entire world capable of engaging in these types of language games. So the universalizability criterion is already implied in the idea of arguing at all. Um, we were also, when it comes to truth, it was like, okay, this, this is a book, this is a, um, uh, a statement that claims, that claims to be true. We would also not say, this is just something that is true for me alone or just at this moment. Uh, it is a statement that says, I think every reasonable person can in principle recognize that this is in fact a book and it is not just a book right now, it remains a book also uh, tomorrow and uh, one, week, one, week from, uh, one week from now. Um, a person who would take this position, say, yeah, but the universalizability criterion is not a point, then, then he would have to take the position that he, can speak a private, that he can speak a private language. He only talks to himself, but then he doesn't need to talk. Then he just simply hits people on the head. So that's, uh, those are two, the two remarks related to, to your comments. And uh, again, any other comment, question, and so forth? Yes, now we should go to questions from the audience and then the faithful exchanges. Uh, the what, what I want to ask Professor Hoppe is about uh, the dialogue in economics among different schools. So, for example, between Austrian economists and mainstream economists or econometricians. And, uh, is it normal for uh, an Austrian economist to engage in a scientific dialogue uh, with other uh, school of thought? For example, positive, posit positivist uh, means attempting to exchange ideas about very narrow, sometimes, not say technical, but very narrow issues, like, for example, the function of uh, central bank or uh, the proper uh, particular policy. Um, because uh, you exchange ideas, uh, my feeling is uh, that ultimately you, you became aware of moral and ethical differences. And uh, th this leads to the, the question whether uh, the Wertfrein claim is uh, really moral in opera. Because uh, my personal feeling that even logical coherence, when you claim from the other party logical coherence, uh, you almost uh, claim a certain uh, moral uh, assumptions uh, yeah. in exchanging ideas. Yeah. So in, the, in this sense, uh, logic, logic also requires some sort of commitment to moral principles that you are consistent. I mean, some people just say, okay, just uh, yesterday I said this, tomorrow I say this, so what? Uh, if you say, but they contradict each other, then they say, so what? Uh, with people like that, of course, it, you cannot have a discussion because they don't adhere to these types of standards. Now, what the relationship between the Austrians and the mainstream people are concerned, yes, there are, there are certain areas um, where m mostly microeconomic issues, where of course there is agreement that what price controls do. There are very few economists who would have different opinions on price control. On the other hand, I always thought, for instance, something like uh, minimum wage laws would cause unemployment. Again, the huge majority of, Aus of uh, economists, Austrians and non-Austrians, agree on that. But if you are committed to a positivist methodology, you don't. You can also find people who think that minimum wage laws actually. Uh, increase employment. Uh, we just had uh, one of these guys, what is Krueger, uh, he was, who, who maintains this position, has done some studies and found out that whatever employment did somewhere went up, <laughs> despite the fact that they have minimum wage laws. Uh, he was just appointed to 
uh, the Clinton, uh, Clinton uh, Ob Obama's uh, economic advisory uh, advisory team. Um, Chicago economists think that the demand curves can also slope upward. It just doesn't occur much, but it is conce it's conceivable. Again, we would, of course, think that this is completely inconceivable. They misunderstand what the law of demand, the law of marginal utility, and so forth implies. Um, but the more general question, how do, how do we deal with these types of people? And I think there I tend to think that there is some truth in in the thesis that Thomas Kuhn had about the structure of scientific revolution. Now his, his thesis is the view has always been, um, so somebody formulates a hypothesis and then it is tested and then people become convinced it is false uh, and then that is gradually we march up into, up into the light. And he points out that historically at least that is entirely false. You can have all sorts of falsifying experiences and people still don't give up the idea. And what leads to major breakthroughs is the old generation who clings to their idea regardless of what the empirical evidence shows simply dies out uh, and another generation takes the field and the discipline in their hand. Now this has happened, so to speak, to the Austrians um, because their view was in a way the mainstream view until the mid-30s. Um, I mean, if you take a look at the book like Lionel Robbins' book on uh, uh, the significance, uh, nature and significance of economic science. No, this is a straightforward Misesian book. Um, and was was used as uh, as a main textbook for introduction into the method and methodology of of economics. Um, in the meantime, that is so far removed from what economists do, uh, and what has simply happened is uh, not that there was any refutation taking place. Just new people all of a sudden did something else and the other people died out and just a few remnants were left over. Um, so I think the only hope that we have is that something like that will happen again and it will be, they will be dying out and we will be, the, we will be taking over. Uh, and, and certain dramatic events can of course maybe help in this. Um, I mean it has definitely helped the Austrian school, uh, first that communism broke apart and now that we have this huge financial crisis which all the mainstream economists have admitted we had no idea, we didn't see it coming. Uh, the Chicago economists rational expectation, people, it seems like that cannot happen uh, because of all the right information are already incorporated in all the, in the stock market prices and so forth. So how can, so it did not happen in their view. So that people are unemployment is just, no, they, they probably just wanted to take a voluntary vacation or something like this. Um, so these events might help us, um, but we also have to be aware of the fact, of course, that, that the Austrian school is a dangerous school. Dangerous in the sense that Almost all economists nowadays in the Western world are employed by indirectly or directly state-funded institutions and practically all macroeconomists are dependent on uh, Federal Reserve money and grants and invitations and so forth. With, with the exception of, of a handful of well-known people, uh, all of them are on their payroll. Uh, and even though I'm not a believer in the Marxian idea that das Sein bestimmt das Bewusstsein, the being determines uh, consciousness, yeah, but it has a little bit to do with it. Uh, if you know where your money is coming from, uh, even if you realize that might not be right, then at least you shut up about that subject and, and uh, study something that does not get you into trouble. So we are up against yeah, uh, a group of people 
uh, who command almost unlimited funding as compared to what we can offer. But I do not think, I mean, some of, some Austrian uh, economists think what we should do is we should infiltrate the universities <laughs> and then put and, and publish, publish in their journals. Only if we publish in their journals will we ever be taken seriously. I think that is just, that is so I mean, so ridiculous. Uh, none of their articles we would accept in our journals. None of our articles they accept into, uh, into, their, uh, into their journal. We just operate side by side and hope that the circumstances will change in such a way that they will die out and, um, and, we, will, and we will take over. What we have in favor of the Austrians is they can talk to real people. Um, I mean, what we say makes, so to speak, sense. An educated layman can understand what the arguments are. Um, whereas if you have these mainstream economists, I mean, I had many people applying for jobs and then giving a, a speech. Um, you know, at the end, I could not summarize in five sentences what the whole talk was all about. I didn't know, I literally didn't know what, what the, what the, top, what the topic was, what the purpose of all of it was, and what the conclusion uh, of, all of, the, of all of this was. And there are increasing numbers of people who see that these people who just sit there on TV and make comments, uh, that they are just bullshitters. It's like the, uh, after the stock market fell, then they say, oh yeah, that was because of profit taking. They didn't know that the day before that there would be the next day profit taking taking place. And how can profit taking be an argument for, because somebody must have bought the stock. So there were obvious, people took profits and the other ones took deliberately losses. Um, none of this, I mean, this, this nonsense we have to listen to from day in and day out and increasingly the reputation of economists is so low. Um, unfortunately, we are affected by this to a certain extent too because when I tell, tell you I'm an economist, I say, oh, the, the, but where should I invest my money? I mean, I, I have not the faintest idea where I should invest my money. But certain things, of course, we do know and these mainstream people do not know. How can it be that an increase in paper can bring about greater prosperity for a society? Now, in plain words, this is what 98% of all economists believe. Um, oh, what is this quantitative easing? It's not, nothing else but belief that additional pieces of paper will cause prosperity to break out. And every, every child in kindergarten understands that that cannot be. But you never hear anyone in these talk shows asking this question. I explain this to me. I, so if I have five, six people a year and, uh, and we have monopoly, monopoly money uh, and I add more to it, how can it be that uh, tomorrow somebody will be richer? Um, no, no explanation for this. So I think the mainstream economics is just, um, yeah, hopeless. So perhaps you wouldn't agree with Walter Block, who holds exactly the contrary to the main universities and learn Keynesian economics and putting them publishing their journals. I, I I don't agree with Walter on. On that one, there are a few yeah, others. There are a few other things I don't agree with. Walter. I mean, we are good friends, but um, uh, when it comes to strategic issues, I see things somewhat differently than, than he does. Yeah. What would then be the role of us here in the teach at the state university? Could we quit? Oh no, 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 no. I would. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say that either. Um, but I would not necessarily always in, encourage people only to have careers as university professors in mind. There exist other career opportunities too that so always you want should the competition be. Of, uh, what? You want the competition of ways to. Uh, to pro you can to promote, promote. You can promote the cause in in Very many easy. different in many different ways. And all should be tried. Yes.
May I ask you a question? Yeah. First of all, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Professor Hoppe for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to meet him. <coughs> um, for your information, I asked permission of Professor Hoppe to translate uh, one of his books, uh, Economic Science and uh, Austrian Method. It's, uh, in, uh, it's still going uh, uh, very hard for, uh, for me because I had no time for this lately. But uh, uh, I would like to assure you that uh, this project will be complete and you will, uh, I'll let you know when uh, Good. the job is done. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I have uh, two, uh, two questions that uh, uh, I try to answer myself. First of all, is uh, an applied one. Uh, how do you, how do we deal with uh, the theory of property rights uh, in uh, family? The relationship between uh, parents and uh, child. For example, uh, me as a father, uh, um, in uh, my relationship with my sons, when do they have? full property rights on uh, their own body. Uh, I think they have. And uh, uh, I think the, the criterion that, uh, that the, the Rothbard gave is in a way a sensible criterion. I mean, obviously you cannot say a specific age, you cannot say at three, at four, or five, that depends, the, the children are I, different. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. To, uh, to, uh, uh, to better for be, for a better underst uh, understanding, it's uh, uh, the time when he is uh, uh, born, or uh, uh, he is uh, in her uh, mother. Um, he's uh, when he is unborn, but he still exists. That's a t that's a tricky question. Um, I do, I do think that regardless of what your position is on should abortion be permitted or should it not be permitted, it can never be an issue that is an issue for the state. It can only be an issue for those parties that are directly involved. That is, the mother and maybe the father and maybe the grandparents and so forth. So it would have to be regarded as a family matter that should be disputed and decided with, within the family. To have a state law saying abortion is all right or saying that abortion is not all right, I think I would be opposed to any of these solutions. The matter has traditionally been handled within, within families. Uh, pressure is generated on the woman to either not abort or to abort. And their decision, whatever the decision they come to, should be respected because it has been made by those people who are directly or indirectly affected by it. That would be my my position on this. Um, and we, we do not have to be able to decide all questions that arise in, in life. Um, these, these lifeboat situations that people frequently bring. Uh, that you touched upon, somebody comes swimming across the ocean there and uh, wants to crawl onto your island. Um, do you have the obligation to accept them onto your island or can you say, hey, swim back where you came from? Um, yes, a person might have the right to say, swim back where you came from, but the consequences might be quite drastic. He might not be punished. But a person like this can be ostracized. Um, 
Nobody might ever want to have anything to do again with a person that made a decision such as this. On the other hand, it might be an arch enemy uh, who has previously killed uh, my father, my mother, and now comes to gets out of the water and wants to crawl onto my island. In that case, uh, people might well see that's what he deserved to get told, swim back where you came from. Um, so not all, sit one should free oneself from the illusion that all conceivable scenarios we must be able to hammer out an immediate solution to it. There is in a free society also a function for lawyers and judges. Uh, you bring your conflicts before third parties uh, who command respect uh, and they come up with judgments that are in accordance with local traditions, regional traditions um, and so forth. Uh, I have Again, coming back to the abortion case, there are very few opponents of abortion who would just go as far as to say, even if uh, fetus is the result of a rape, uh, the woman should be obliged to carry the kid until birth. Um, again. I have, I have no clear-cut answer what, what the decision should be in this situation. Uh, this is something for family courts, family councils and so forth to inside, de decide, but it is certainly nothing that should be a matter of state policy. Can, can I take up uh, just two, two phrases on this question? It, it's uh, because it's a, it's a follow-up. Uh, it's a huge comparative advantage to be able within the framework of uh, property rights theory to ask this kind of question because if you would have been a Lockean, you know, the impregnating your person with the resource, you would rather have the problem that Locke himself had and had to solve somehow. Uh, Unplausibly, he solved it, but he tried to. He was aware of the problem. If property is the result of irreversible mix of your person with something, if it's in these terms, then how come children are not the property of the parents? Because they are the result of, an, in Lockean terms, of an impregnation, right? So they should be the, uh, the property of the parents. So. Uh, the pro, I, I mean, the comparative advantage is huge between asking how come uh, children are not the property of the parents and asking uh, when they are uh, the owners of their own body. Right? Uh, maybe uh, there is no definite solution, but it's an advantage to have this sort of these sort of questions within the framework and not the other sort of questions. Yeah. One, one thing is, of course, it is decisive, are, does there a parasitic relationship exist or is the parasitic relationship over? Once, once they are born, the parasitic relationship is over. Bef before they are attached, I mean, biologically speaking, as a, as a parasite to somebody else. So this is a decisive moment when the umbilical cord is cut, so to speak. Then the second, the second thing is, kids of course are not, once they're born, certainly not produced by their parents in the sense that we produce a refrigerator or a telephone. Um, because uh, we can always say there, there are goods that are ap appropriated and there are goods that are naturally owned. Over my body, I have direct control, and every person has only direct control over their own body. I can have control over his body, but not directly, only by using my, by my body first. 
the, the parents have control over the kid, but not, no, di no direct control. And who has direct control or indirect control, direct control logically precedes, of course, in indirect, uh, indirect control. And that we have direct control, the proof is simple. I can say, I, I decide to lift my arm. Uh, I can make your arm go up too, but not in, not in this way. I would have to lift lift it up. You are the only one who can just will certain things to happen with something to which you are in a way tied as nobody else is tied. In so, in so far, the argument, uh, yeah, but parents were impregnant, the mother was impregnated, and because of this, the child is, so to speak, the product just like a telephone is a product of the telephone producer, does not work. If the, te if the telephone would, in fact, uh, once it has been produced, then all of a sudden uh, just yeah, call people up on its own uh, and, uh, and receive telephone calls without me interfering, then we would have to say, maybe the telephone is just also a rational entity and we have to uh, apply the same type of reasoning that we apply to humans too. <coughs> in a way, our physical appearance is in a way completely irrelevant when it comes to what, what rights or not rights to apply to us. Uh, I mean, we can imagine that some entities come down from Mars who look entirely different from us. How would we decide that they are either like us uh, or that they are wild beasts or autom automatons? And the answer is, we would have to try out if, if they can engage in some sort of argumentation or not. Um, they might look entirely different from us. They might be ten times as large as we are or ten times as small as we are or have uh, different hairdo or who knows what. The decisive is, in fact, can they argue or can they not argue? Uh, can they rely on the, f on the force of words, so to speak, in order to induce people to do certain actions and abstain from, uh, from other actions? So, can we conclude, for example, that uh, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a moral right of the parents before the private property of uh, uh, his sons over their, uh, his own body. There is a, so uh, the moral right pre-exists of the uh, private right? Yes, I, I, agree. <coughs> I agree, but in the sense that you say the libertarian ethics is only concerned to speak with punishable offenses and non-punishable offenses. Uh, uh, moral things go beyond that and are punished in a different way. They are punished by ostracism, um, by not having anything to do with people who do such and such, um, by cutting them off from, from other ties, by boycotting them, uh, by telling other people, this is a swine, how can you possibly deal with this person, or this is a really decent and good man, we should just help him out. Um, so what the, what the libertarian ethic does is, is so speak, does not answer all questions that arise in life. It only helps us to make sense. Should this be punished? Uh, or should this not be punished with physical threats? Um, but coming back to what Christian said before, Yes, you can also be a libertarian, not breaking any property law, laws, and still you can be the most unpleasant person that you can possibly imagine, with whom you never would want to have anything to do. And there exist quite a few of those. You, you had a second question. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a second question. In our uh, real world, world. I think, uh, um, let's say, uh, um, especially for uh, Romanian society, uh, there, is a, uh, there is no interest for um, <coughs> speaking, arguing on uh, a moral 
foundation. So, uh, what happened, or uh, do you think it is, it is possible uh, to be changed those uh, principles, those institutions, fundamental institutions, such as principle uh, of uh, ethics or morality in a society? To, uh, for example, uh, let's say it's, uh, uh, we live in a democracy, the God that failed actually. Uh, and uh, uh, the majority of us vote for other principles uh, to conduct our uh, uh, actions other than uh, the uh, principles that we believe in. Yeah. What do we do about this? Principles? What do we do? Yeah. Um, yeah, we just. Uh, since we since we can't change it by f flipping our fingers, we have to ad adjust to it as much as we can, uh, or as just as, as much as needed. Uh, promote uh, uh, <coughs> promote the idea that there is something wrong with it, and try to convince people that that is the case. We have no we have no other choice. Should Ron Paul win, I would say yes. But if you would ask me, will Ron Paul win, I would say he no. has no chance in hell. Uh, <laughs> and since he will not win, it will have absolutely, it will have absolutely no effect whatsoever. Um, uh, you might, uh, I'm even afraid that given that there are major economic problems, the states frequently, in order to just distract people and uh, make, make them pay attention to other things, there might be even more warlike attempts in the making. I'm very fearful of this uh, potential attack against Iran, for instance, and it seems like almost all of the presidential candidates, except Ron Paul, who will not win, uh, look with a sympathetic eye uh, towards the possibility of an attack against Iran. So in this sense, I tend to be rather pessimistic also, I must say. Um, Ron Paul has had a major impact in America insofar as he had, has made many people who previously never heard about these ideas aware of these ideas. But the numbers are still so small um, and the numbers of the masses that get dumber by the year and I think not only in the United States, that applies in Germany. And so you have, I have the feeling the population gets more and more stupid from year to year. Um, so that's why I some cannot quite share the optimism that some of my friends display at various occasions. The optimism that they display has frequently the reason 
that they are engaged in fundraising activities and if you want to fu raise funds you have to be you have to pretend to be optimistic because the, the donors want to see some success and the success should not be in 100 years for their grandchildren. They would like to see a little bit of success in their own lifetime also. So you cannot always take the optimistic pronouncement at, pronouncements that you hear at face, at face value. It's, sometimes I think the people themselves don't believe in it. But I, again, I don't want to be too up, too pessimistic. <laughs> okay, two, two more questions, and probably the last questions. If uh, if there is no other really burning one coming up, uh, let, let me just. You see, there is, there is a certain amount of personal enjoyment in the fact that you understand something, that you grasp something. And I think that should, that should be sufficient for us to do what we do. Um, I, would do the same, I would do the same thing uh, even if I knew that it would have no impact whatsoever. Because I think it is just the right thing. This is, I, I like the truth. I like to grasp what is going on around me and get a certain enjoyment that I can predict. Oh, look, this idiot! Tomorrow he will do this idiotic action, and then I say, Hey, I predicted it. He did exactly what I said. Even though that was all, he did all the wrong things for all the wrong reasons and so forth. But it gives me enjoyment to see that I understand the world in such a way um, that I can sometimes sit in my chair and laugh. Look exactly how I predicted. These people are even more idiotic than most people thought, but you had predicted it right. So. Uh, going back to the portion, because perhaps all in this room, or most of you are familiar with uh, someone who has ethics of liberty and made a translation which is not published yet. But right there, it's, uh, you can see an argument uh, about abortion in uh, this way. Is there any possibility to view this case in this way? The parents are directly responsible and they are the main cause for the children's inability. So it will follow logic from here that you have to raise him until he gets Yeah. So as to and, and if you and if you don't do it, then you have to make sure that the ki the kid is offered f yes. for adoption to somebody yes. who and would if do this. If we agree with this thing, then uh, uh, if if the parents are killers, uh, remains this question: if the state uh, should uh, should go there and uh, and uh, restrict. Abortion of let it be. I mean, uh, it, is, it, is it the state a criminal when he intervenes in abortion, or he he only uh, he frames a criminal, another criminal, for the tax? But again, it wouldn't have to be the state. Every private person could do that. Yes, also. yes, right? yes. But yeah. what would happen if? But with the state, the argument against society. the state would be because the state gets its funding, so to speak, in a criminal way. If a private person would prevent this sort of thing from happening, he would do it with his own resources. So it would be more moral if a private person would intervene in the way that you said, and, this, and the state would stay out of it entirely. Because after, after all, I mean, even, even the personnel that it sends in there to do whatever they do, uh, would be personnel that is funded by illegitimate, uh, in an illegitimate way. I mean, it's like inviting some, somebody on your boat, and then you are... And then you're dumping him off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a possibility to be... Yeah, that is a vi violation of, of the contracts that, so to speak, uh, uh, exist. How, how about libertarians working for the state? Are we in a situation of moral schizophrenia? 
Okay. Uh, yeah, I know. If it, I worked for a state university too. I would say. Um, no, I, I think um, this is you. You, you, pro, you privatize uh, st stolen stolen resources if you don't do anything uh, that is itself objectionable. Than with the resources, then it is okay. Um, I, for instance, I, I never taught in any of my classes that taxation is just. I always said taxation is uh, stealing. The government is a criminal organization. Uh, they let me um, they left me alone with that. Uh, if they would have told me now, you have to just teach this and that and say such and such and avoid saying such and such, then I would have been implicated in, in their scheme. I think there are very few professions where that is possible. A university professor is one of, the, one of the professions where, at least in the United States, I think also probably in Romania too in the meantime, in Germany also. I mean, once you have the position, you can say these things and they leave you alone. In that case, uh, since you do not know from whom the money was stolen, so to speak, and cannot give it back to the original owners of the money, the money has been stolen, it cannot be traced back to where it came from, uh, then I think uh, it is legitimate to, uh, to be a university professor and uh, working for a state <laughs> university. There is, the, the private universities are in this regard no different. They receive, of course, uh, government government grants. There are governmentally licensed uh, licensed instit institutions, um, but in uh, then there might there might be also personal uh, extenuating extenuating circumstances. In addition to this, I when I was in Nevada, I was on the board of directors of a company. Um, with practically no payment, but um, he, he was one of the biggest taxpayers in the state of Nevada. He, he told me, look, I mean, I want, I want you to do this sort of thing. Um, so he covered my salary tenfold uh, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of taxes. My, my parents, uh, my grandparents were expropriated by the Russians in East Germany. We did not get our property back. The value of the property was about 10, 10 million euros. We got 100,000 euros compensation for this. So I have many, many years where I can steal from the German government <laughs> without, with, without anybody being able to say that you are stealing anything. They owe me so much money, they don't even know how much they owe me. You are the 1% in the You got 1%. 1%. Right. And uh, the last question of Tagan. Speaking of uh, moral schizophrenia, I must confess I suffer a slight variety of this disease because I work as a scholar in the public sector and as a journalist, as a writer in the private one. So uh, you should be aware of the fact that you speak with Dr. Jack and Mr. Hyde. I'm not very sure who's asking the question. Um, I want to ask you one, I think, very tough question. Uh, the answer of which I'm very much aware of, at least I think so. Um, but I want to ask it just for the sake of verifying my logic and my intuition. So the question is, uh, I, I put it under the umbrella of uh, free market paradox, and, and uh, it says that how come that uh, in the free market, free market ideas are not capitalizing too much profit? Because there's a crowding out effect. Um, too many resources are automatically withdrawn into opposite directions and there is very little left over, but there is some. I mean, there are private donations. Uh, there are big donors. But not so big, 
not so not, not too big. <laughs> yeah, not too big. Yeah. yeah. No, I think the best the best answer is there is crowding out effect. Yeah, I don't see a so I don't see a so I don't see a solution. Um, the only solution is just to persuade, to persuade um, donors that it is worth their money to support uh, intellectuals, book, book publications, and so forth. Uh, that works better in some societies. In America, there is a little bit of a culture of this. It is very difficult in in Germany, I assume. The same is true for Romania to find donors, sponsors. Um, I have tried to build a little organization um, myself. Um, first few years I needed considerable subsidies. In the meantime, it carries itself. I have enough people who pay me to come attend these uh, these conferences and I have a few people who are so enthused about the whole thing that they give me uh, sizable donations that allow me to subsidize students to come there for free or very small sums of money. So we have to try very hard to to improve, but I I agree this is a toughie. And I just was wondering if the answer doesn't have to do who, to who the money masters are. You know, if if, if they are counterfeiters, they will systematically uh, you know direct the money, you know, counterfeit money to cover the counterfeiting. So political parties who want to counterfeit, you know, protection to counterfeit. Uh, for counterfeiting, you know, education for counterfeiting, but if someone like Hans comes along, mm -hmm. how would you expect him to make big profits with this kind of message? Mm -hmm. you know? As long as there is, there is this institution in place, as long as the printing press is in place, as long as, as we don't have natural money. Okay, and this optimistic note, <laughs> we should uh, wrap up uh, our first event today. Uh, of course, uh, we have to thank Professor Hoffman for being with us here. And uh, I have to remind you that uh, we meet again at uh, 18 uh, hundred hours so this evening, right across the hall. Uh, and Professor Hoffman will uh, give a speech then. So that being said, it will be a speech about money oh, and business. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> On politics, money, and politics, money. Thank, thank goodness that I don't have to ask the <laughs> questions.